trying to make my voice sound deeper. <laughs> All right, let's just uh, clap to sync the sound. And we're doing the Ramsey Dewey podcast again. We're back finally with Jawad Mahmoudi, the one, the only. If you're not familiar with this guy, he is one of the best kickboxers I have personally met and trained with. Uh, amazing technique. Hopefully we'll we'll get some technique videos out after this podcast. But Jawad, how are you today? I'm pretty good, Ramsey. It's great to see you again. It's been a while. It's been a while, and back to be uh, back on. Glad to be back on the podcast. Yeah. Well, welcome back. Um, and we were just talking about how we haven't done a podcast in a while, and a bunch of my YouTube viewers are like, Ramsey, do more podcasts. So here we are. So we were talking before the podcast about um, how both of us got better as martial artists, essentially after retiring from fighting and focusing on coaching. So um, for me, that, that was a huge transition. Like when I, fight, when I was fighting, I honestly kind of sucked because I didn't take the time to really train and understand the technique the way I should have. And it was just about getting the next fight and getting the next paycheck more than anything. And once I started coaching, I developed this idea like, you know, it's not about me anymore. It's about helping these guys to win fights. What was that transition like for you? I totally agree with that. For me, I, I truly believe that I became much better of a martial artist when I started to coach. Uh, remember on the, the first time we met, like I told you, I had books. And uh, basically on these books, I write my techniques, some details and uh, some of the combo. And some of things make more sense once you start to coach because you really go in depth with the technique. Um, someone that have a great uh, inspect on that is uh, Samad Payakaran, actually, uh, when he was uh, actually saying that uh, foreigners started to become like better coaches and better fighter than Thai people because mm. in the culture of Thai people when you're good it's just like you're naturally good when um, foreigner will actually take the time to study each of the move the detail why you're putting your feet that way why you're making a transition from the front to the back and that's something that when you uh, when you're a coach that care yeah, that's something you actually push because you you're aiming to to be the best coaches you can for your students for me again Martial arts is all about sharing, so you want your students to understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, so at some point they can share it too. So I totally agree with that. Um, I, I got my, uh, myself, I got much better uh, after starting to coach uh, than I was before. That, that reminds me so much of Jack Dempsey's book, Championship Fighting, at the beginning. Have you read it? I didn't uh, read uh, Jack Dempsey's book, unfortunately. I know you're a great fan, of, a huge yeah. fan of Jack Dempsey, but uh, I didn't read that book, unfortunately. Oh, man. So at the beginning of the book, he has this chapter titled something like uh, Punchers are made, not born, which goes against a lot yeah. of uh, conventional wisdom. A lot of people think yeah. you know, you're born with it or you're not. And throughout most of his career, people would pat him on the back and say, you're the best, you're a natural. And he, he wrote about, well, I, I just started believing it, like I'm the best, I'm a natural, I'm just born with it. But after retiring from fighting, people would ask him, like, hey, can you show me this move? Can you show me how to box? And he realized, you know what? This is stuff I actually learned. I had coaches. They showed me these things. I practiced these things. I wasn't born this way. I wasn't always the heavyweight champion of the world. And so he took this very introspective look and wrote tons of notes, very reminiscent of what you do in your notebooks. Um, I, I wish we could show some of those notebooks just... just just, I will. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's almost like every musical day. notation of fighting technique that Jawad has in these notebooks. It's, it might be completely incomprehensible to you unless, unless you explain it to us. But yeah, he took just introspective notes about how everything works, why the footwork works, why, why the, the body mechanics may produce power and, and so on. So, whew, I gotta read your... Got to reject Dempsey, man. I, I took that for my father, actually. Like yeah. my father, because my father was the one who had like a book with techniques in the beginning. And when I was a kid, like you know, I would see like you know his book with all the technique. Mostly it was the class he would teach. And uh, when I started to coach, I call him and be like, "Hey, Dad, uh, could you please like you know send me like you know the book you had uh, when you were giving the class?" And he was mm -hmm. like, "Oh, I must have that somewhere, but I don't use that for a while because my father has been coaching for almost 40 years, so it's it's something now he, he totally have." But yet, yeah, when I first started to coach, I, um, I took inspiration from uh, my father's book to see how he was building the classes, how he was building uh, the technique. 
and then I made it my own and I uh, continue to to uh, to add more and more and more techniques and more details into it but yeah it's uh, it's definitely something that uh, you can build step by step I actually advise my students to uh, when they want to start to work by themselves oh how can I work on the bag I'm like look take a book write down each combo you're gonna do so jab yeah. jab cross jab 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 cross jab and every time you do a combo do it for two three minutes and write it down on the paper and every time you're going to come back to that book you can see oh i did that i did that i did that and film it and that's yeah. that's a very easy way to improve by yourself step by step you can correct your posture you can see the details and then like step by step it's like again learning music you learn like do re mi fa sol la si do that's the same thing i learned the jab i learned the cross the per the hook yeah this is a really interesting concept uh, I, I always advise my students when they say, how can I improve? I say, film your sparring and mm -hmm. analyze it. Totally. One thing I really should say more is write this stuff down. I have a friend, Franco de Leonardis. He was a Shidokan karate champion mm -hmm. back in the day. And also an MMA fighter and uh, jiu-jitsu black belt. And he came and did a seminar at uh, the old JX Fight Club back in the day. And one thing he really focused on was write down what you learn after you train. He said, you don't have to make like an accurate record, like I, I, I did this move and this move and this move, because you won't remember it all, but write, write down what you learned. Yep. So if you really want to remember it. And I was like, huh, that's, that's very interesting. That's what. So I started doing that, and it really does have a very yep. transformative power, just taking the effort to take a pencil or a pen and physically yep. write on paper ingrains it into into the memory in a very unique way and they do that for meetings too like every leader or like big companies when they have a, a big meeting they advise you again to take a piece of paper write down the thing you remember from that meeting so it's uh, i think it's just something that humans tend to forget to do but it's uh, it's definitely something that will help you to remember when you're trying to learn something that's totally true yeah like absolutely one thing that was really interesting about that seminar, like there was some fairly complex stuff that Franco taught, you know, about leg locks and leg entanglements and stuff that, uh, that honestly was above my level at that point. Mm. But I took notes and I wrote down what I learned, and I remember every single detail of that seminar. And I've been to a ton of seminars, you probably have too, where they, they teach a bunch of stuff, so you, you, know, you feel like you get what you paid for, mm. and maybe you remember one thing or two things, and that's still valuable. Like I went to this great jujitsu seminar on guard passing and they showed like 20 different guard mm -hmm. passes and I remember one of them. I still use it, so it was worth the money, but I wish I had just taken some notes. Yeah, I feel you. That's why when I give seminar, it's like, <laughs> it's one movement yeah. and we grind it like with different angle, but like it's one movement. So at the end of the day, you practice like the same movement for one hour and a half <laughs> and you are the same. Yeah. And yeah, I believe like the... A again, you know, it's it like in repetition too. Like the more you're gonna, the more you're gonna do it again and over again, the more you're gonna learn it. And the best way to to uh, drill that again is to have it on paper so you can just take it. Okay, I remember that move. Okay, I can do it again and again and again and again and again, step by step. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, when I opened up my first gym. I opened up the small gym back in the United States. Oh, and yeah, the gym in the U.S. I thought yeah. you started in China. No, my first gym yeah. was in the U.S. No. Uh, it wasn't open that long. We were open about a year before I moved to China. Okay. Uh, and it was just, just a small gym. I had about six students, uh, several of whom went on to become pro fighters. And, you know, we, we, we got a lot of stuff done. It was, it was a great uh, training time. But uh, I opened up my first gym, and then I invited um, my two coaches to come and show my students some things. And, you know, I was, I was, I was feeling very proud. Like, I've, got, <laughs> I've got my own gym now. Come, come see. I've got my students. And so my, my two coaches, uh, they come and they're like, all right, we're gonna practice get-ups. I'm like, okay, and then what? Get-ups. So for one hour, all we did was get-ups, just get-ups. Somebody takes you down, you get up. Somebody takes you down in this position, you get up. And at first I was like, but, but this is so simple. It's so, and the more I thought about it though, the more I appreciated the genius in, in what my coaches were, were trying to teach me and my students that you know it, it it doesn't matter you know the complexity of the technique if you're pinned on the floor you can't do anything yeah. I mean you fix that problem first so you can get up because in the immortal words of, of uh, Terry Silver the evil villain from the Karate Kid 3 if a man can't stand he can't fight 
Jiu-Jitsu nerds will disagree, yeah. but still. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure like yeah, yeah. Jiu-Jitsu people will disagree. There's 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 truth to that, man. If if you don't know how to get up off your back, you are extremely limited in what you can I agree. Do I totally agree. For me, like if you cannot fight on the ground or if you cannot like you know get up or again if you're a great uh, kickboxer boxer but you cannot do anything on the ground you're not complete if you're doing amazing on the ground but when you're on your two legs you cannot do anything you're not complete too like that's why like mma in the end of the day is like the the king of any, any martial arts it's a mix of everything yeah so you're gonna be able to to yeah to, even if you're not like amazing but at least you know how to defend yourself in any position i think that's what's really important at the end of the day and like, it's really funny because you know, like what your coach did. Uh, I'm starting, you know, uh, online classes with my dad. So for the, the okay. people of my, uh, my my students on Thursday evening, like you know, my dad is gonna give the class from France. Interesting. And the first thing he said was like, okay, um, next Thursday, just put the video, and I want to assess them, see their level, and then we work back on learning the jab, the cross, the uppercut, and the hook. And I'm like, but I taught them this movement. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> like, do I look like I care? <laughs> it's like we're gonna go back to everything and see their level. <laughs> we're like, well, fine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. so it reminds me of detailed, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Master class from yeah. you know, one of the best in the business, and that's what they get, right? But yeah. it's the basics. But even though there is some some movements, I disagree with my father, for example, because I um, what I believe is my my father, my uncle, they are the one who, who shaped me, uh, you know, into the the, the the person I am in terms of martial arts. But like everything, martial arts, it evolves. There is things that are gonna change. There are things that are considered old school. That's still, that's still perfect, but there is things that you can change in your own way. So what they gave me, um, I changed some of those movements, some of those techniques. Uh, I added some things to it. And uh, sometimes, yeah, my father is like, oh no, you have to do this movement that way. And I'm like, yeah, I understand, but you can do it that way like that. And my father would be like, no, no, no. You know, old school mentality. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, there is some movement. I know um, I'm going to like, com I have conflict with my father on the how to do the movement. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, I think it's great to, to take this input from people to, uh, who have more experience than you, who are like, you know, uh, who did years and years, but it's good to keep your eyes open on, into uh, new things. Yeah. Being able to, to always change the flow because if you cannot evolve, you die. Like, exactly like everything, right. if you cannot evolve, you die. Exactly, so. it's it's really tempting when you see something, somebody doing something different than you to think like, ah, oh, that's wrong. Like I had this experience the other day in a jiu-jitsu class. I'm training with uh, with uh, Guy, the uh, jiu-jitsu coach here, second degree black belt, very, very good grappling. And um, he's showing a setup for a straight ankle lock and I'm rolling with this guy who doesn't know the straight ankle lock. And so I show him how to finish it. And there are a bunch of different ways to finish a straight ankle lock. So I show him the way that I do it. And then Guy comes over and he's, uh, he's like, do it this way. And then he does it like radically different than what I'm doing. And at first I'm thinking, but if I do it that way, this will happen, but I'm watching. And I'm thinking, well, there's a reason he does it this way. There's a reason he sets it up this way. And you know, it's not my way, but there's, you know, there's obviously some value in it. So I'm gonna pay attention. And maybe I'll use it that way, maybe I won't, but I'm gonna pay attention because you know, somebody's gonna eventually use the straight ankle lock that way against me. Yeah. So I'm gonna to have to know how to defend it. That's the, that's the thing, like uh, it happened a lot with striking, for example, with kicking. Like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm someone that like, I love to kick. The thing is like a lot of, a lot of times some people like come to train with me and like the way they kick is like the, Arm swing, uh, down yeah. hard, away, away, type bullshit. The thing is, I, I try to make people understand, like, look, why are you doing this movement? It's not wrong. It's just like, it, it's yeah. not good for what we're doing right now. If you're making a kick going upward, first of all, you never want to drop that hand because, well, you're exposed, but you can actually use a kick going upward if it's more like in a kickboxing fashion to come back very fast with boxing, where our middle kick where I pass my hips, step outside and make a frame is like a finisher. That's the last technique I'm going to send. Yeah. So both are fine. You just have to find the why are you doing that movement? Exactly. Why at that moment? One at this sense. There's always a reason. But uh, like a great example. Um, you familiar with Joe Valtellini? No. I kickboxer, Bazooka Joe Valtellini. Anyway, he's um, 
he's he's a kickboxer, pretty good one. Got a decent YouTube channel. Shout out to Joe Beltellini. But um, he's got some technique videos on throwing kicks with a high guard up. Yes, which is yes. Very really strange and unusual, and most people will tell you that's bad and wrong. That's good. And yet <clears throat> he's won many fights doing this. And obviously there's value to it. Uh, and his, his rationale is I protect my face while I kick. I love you, Joe. I don't know who you are, but I will find out and uh, I will check your video. Yeah, man. Joe's got some good stuff out there. Yesterday I was teaching my students, put your, both of your, put your hands on your head and drill your knees. With, when they're opening on the line, I know. Keep your hands, your palm on the top of your head. Make a ball and send your knees from here. Send your kicks from here. Focus on rotating on your pivot leg, passing your hips, making a smooth transition in and out without the use of any um, swing of your hands. Because once you start to have a strong pivot, you have a strong mirror kick. But like, uh, it's something like you know we can uh, we can uh, film a bit later. Like it's uh, it's yeah. a very very useful drill to get that base and that rotation. Then at the end of the day, the, the hands are still going to be useful, of course, but you don't always need to use your hands to send like that super strong and fast middle kick. Middle, yeah. knees, low, high, any kind of kick, basically. Any kind of circular kick, sorry. Yeah, what well, you were saying about always having a reason for doing what you do. Yeah. That we, we had a conversation about this in a boxing class I taught last night. We had a couple of new guys come in trying it out for the first time. And they say, we want to know what we're doing wrong. And, well, you're doing everything wrong when you start. <laughs> and so they, they get more specific and they're like, well, our guard, show us, show us what we're doing with our guard. I'm like, okay. There are many ways to do a guard in boxing. You know, you can have a high guard, you can have a Philly shell, you can do a long guard, whatever. The, the most important thing, have a reason for having your Thank hands you. and your shoulders where you have them. Yep. Like if, if you have a... Your hands down, have a good reason for that. If you don't have a good reason for that, put your hands where they're going to be useful. And so little light bulbs click on and off and they start thinking, okay, okay. I must have a reason to do what I do. Yep. This makes sense. <clears throat> and you're totally right on that. It happened the same in Muay Thai. And I always tell people, sometimes people that train with Thai people will tend to be here. And then they send a punch like that. And I like to ask them like, why are you actually putting your hands out? It's like, what's your reason? And they're like, oh, I got taught like that. I'm like, yeah, but this is a gun that's gonna be useful for long gun, for knees, for elbow, some for kicks sometimes, but while doing a nice focus on boxing. So if you're here, you don't have a proper guard for boxing. You're not gonna be able to get any torque from that, uh, from that uh, shoulder. So instead of being like that, try to have a hammer stance. If you want to be more defensive, try to have a more uh, close stance, like you yeah. pick a boost style. So the position of your hands here, 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 is going to have an impact on what you're doing, what's your style. If you're more someone who kicks, someone who clinch, someone who, who send more punches. So a lot of people don't understand that and will always have the same position with their hand when it actually has some real impact on the way you're fighting. Yeah, I think it has a lot Same to for the fit stance. Just... Um the, the implicit trust that we put in, in a coach, like a uh, comment I get a lot on YouTube when people watch a technique video I make and they will say, well, that's not what my karate instructor taught me or that's, that's not what my coach told me. I was taught this. To which I'll reply, well, what has experience taught you? What is your personal experience? What has sparring taught you? <clears throat> and often it's like, well, I don't actually spar, so I don't know. But <laughs> Uh, the same with non sparrows Yeah, man. Uh, man. I have people like that too. Uh, like they don't spar, they don't fight, but they're gonna tell me like, oh no, 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 but it's not like that. I'm like, yeah, okay. Spar and try it. Get your ass kicked a lot, and then you're gonna learn. That that's yeah. the best way to learn. Fail, 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 fail. Like my father was told me, the best lesson I learned through sweat, blood, and tears. Like that's yeah. how you're gonna take your best lessons in life. The more you're gonna fail at something. The more you're going to think, if you're smart, you're going to think like, why did I fail? What can I do to, uh, to make it work? What can I do to make it better? Okay, maybe it's because I was off timing on my footwork or my distance. But by failing, you're going to learn lessons. By learning lessons, you're going to get better. But a lot of people like either way because they're shy or because they're just not cut for that. It happened too. Like the, yeah. the thing with the striking, MMA or anything that involved being hit, um, contrary to grappling, it's like it still involves violence. In grappling, you can be a new white belt and uh, do some role and you're just scrambling and everything's fine. Okay, you can get injured, but everything is fine. If you're in a bad position, 
Okay. Where in striking, it's it you actually get beat up. So it's it's even if it's light, you still get punched in the nose, you still get punched uh, and kicked everywhere. So yeah. it's scarier and it's it it implies more violence, unfortunately. So True. some people are not uh, those are not cut for the the the. the the physical involvement uh, striking uh, is gonna bring, and and this is fine, but yeah, then they they, they should like yeah take a bit of time when they uh, approach uh, techniques and movement. That's yeah, a different thing, man. Especially especially if you're going against a, a guy who's really good at light sparring, to the point where they they will not hurt you, but it just feels oppressive. Yeah. Like there's this just oppressive intensity behind it. Th these are sparring partners that that I really enjoy. And not not at the moment because it feels uh, exhausting and it feels like you're drowning. But uh, <laughs> that's it's it's such a valuable tool. And I was thinking about um, the presentation of technique, like uh, on YouTube, for example. I made a I made a recent video about um, a technique I learned watching um, what was his name B Benson Henderson. And this was years ago. I saw him saw him in the UFC setting up takedowns off of jabbing the leg like level change get really low jabbing the leg and then shooting for a takedown it looks very much the same i was like dang i want to learn that and so i went through this fairly long period of trial and error trying to figure this out and failing time and time again and eventually it i ended integrated it in, into my game and it's something i can use mm -hmm. to a fairly high percentage today so i made a youtube video about it because a lot of people were asking me like watching my sparring videos why are you punching the leg that's not very damaging. So I made a video explaining the rationale behind it, but then I got a lot of comments saying, well, can't you just get kicked in the head if you do that? I'm like, well. There's a risk? There's, there's a risk, mm -hmm. yes. And what's, what's not visible in that video is, is the learning curve, going from sucking at it yeah. and failing <coughs> over and over and over again until you learn the timing and the setup and the distance. So uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's the reality of teaching. It's, it's for me, I, I, I kind of understand why people are like that because look, um, how, how, how many years did you train uh, martial arts? Oh man, decades. How many years? I'm 43 now. Yeah. I started, started formal training at age 17, so that long. That's what I mean. Uh, for me, like, you know, I'm 27 and I've been training as long as I have my memories. See, like, it's my, uh, you know, it's my family business, so yeah. I have more than 20 years of, uh, of Muay Thai martial arts. A lot of people train for five years, six years, 10 years. Yeah. I, I sucked at 10 years. When I trained for 10 years, I sucked. I was getting my ass handed to me every day at the gym. Well, it was my world champion, but I was still getting my ass kicked every day. So yeah. after 10 years of martial arts, you didn't know shit. Yeah. After 20 years of martial arts, I know a bit more. The thing is like a lot of people have think that they have a very deep understanding of technique, martial arts, etc. when it's, it's actually pretty shallow. And uh, again, as human, it's human nature, we're gonna still give our opinion on things. Even if we have a, a shallow understanding of the, 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 the technique, even if we only see the tip of the iceberg, we're still gonna feel that we need to give our input and that we're right. Yeah. Because again, if I see this and I tell you, oh no, I, I can see that, that's the tip of the iceberg, but you can see everything under. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you I'm right, you're wrong. So mm. that, that's what human mostly do, unfortunately. This is in our nature. So, a lot of people are not gonna have the time and experience uh, like that they need to really appreciate or understand some of the techniques, some of the mechanics behind what you're gonna teach, or are not gonna understand that curve that you went through with uh, training right. martial arts. And again, a lot of people like when they see me, they're like, ah, this guy is like, you know, I'm because I, I'm young, I'm 27, I'm, I'm a pup, but. Yeah, I'm some. I'm a young guy that still have more than twenty years of martial arts behind me. Yeah, you got a very high fight IQ, and this is like th there are different types of intelligence: kinesthetic, bodily intelligence, cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, and so and so on. But there's also like fight intelligence, and it's I, I don't know what else to call it. It's 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 has something to do with kinesthetic, bodily intelligence, but. Yeah, some people, a lot of people have very low fight IQs because, you know, most people just don't put in the level of training or train at all. But you have a very high fight IQ. The last time we did a podcast, um, you know, you're, you're, you're predominantly a, a striker, a kickboxer, and again, one, one of the best I've ever met and, and trained with in person. Um, the last time we talked about jujitsu, and you said something along the lines of, uh, if, you, if you wanted to get good at jujitsu, 
uh, and I might be misquoting this, but you would you would have to take a lot of damage on your body. Yeah, in that's that, true. That process. That. Yeah. But um, so I, I've been following you on social media and, and so on since since then, and and I see you you're you're not you're not ignorant of grappling at all. Like you you just showed me some uh, some footage of you sparring with Lee Jin Leung over the UF, UFC Performance Center. And it's mostly striking, but then all of a sudden you shoot for a double leg and it was a really nice shot. In fact, if, if you just sat out and cut the corner, you could have finished it, but it was a really nice setup for that double leg. I was like, man, Jawan's been training. He's been doing... I don't. <laughs> and yet he's like, I don't. I just watch, I just watch Instagram videos. No, actually, uh, that's true. Actually, I just sometimes I scroll on Instagram and I see something and I'm like, oh, that's great. Let's do that in next YouTube competition. It was fun, like last, last week too, you were not there, but I dressed as Ryu from Street Fighter. Yeah, I saw the picture. And yeah, and I got double gold actually, I won double all my match with submission, it was fun. Tournament. It was fun. So and, you uh, seriously don't train Jiu-Jitsu, but... I don't, but, well, I, 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 I was going to the PI to do uh, MMA sparring with uh, yeah. the, the Chinese MMA fighter uh, two times per week on, uh, on uh, Tuesday and on uh, Friday. So this... Uh, I think it really helped me like to, yeah. to improve my grappling. So it kind of rubs off on you. Yeah, because when you do MMA sparring, like when I do striking, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, it's not a problem. But when you add like, you know, the grappling components and you end up on your back and it's raining, yeah. you have to find a solution. Or when like, you know, someone is shooting a single leg or double leg, you have to sprawl. You have to learn how to get out of this situation or attack while they're doing this movement with like an yeah, anaconda. Das or... You'll almost figure it out by, by osmosis. When, when you, you surround have to. yourself with a certain yeah. type of training partner, it, it rubs off on you. You have to, because again, if you cannot evolve, you die. So if you cannot find a solution to that, you're, yeah, you're kind of screwed. And again, I don't like losing. Yeah. I hate losing. So when someone is beating my ass uh, in MMA, in the gym, and I'm on my back, and I'm like, okay, what do I do now? It's not a good feeling. So I have to be like, oh. Okay, I have to find a solution to get rid of that uh, situation. So, for example, that's where I was. Uh, I was actually scrolling on Instagram and I found the um, K guard. Okay, yeah, yeah. And as soon as I went back to the PI, I I begged the guy to put me uh, to to go for the the legs. I go on the gr on the ground and straight away from here, whoosh, shrimp, grab the leg and go for the K guard. Take the guys back and uh, finish by submission. And I was like, oh, it worked. <laughs> Oh man, that works really well <laughs> for long-legged guys, man. Like, uh, man, the first time I heard of K guard, it was Neil Melanson's book, Mastering Triangle Chokes, and it's all about it's like 300 pages of how to finish triangle chokes from the guard, and mm -hmm. then he, he goes on about K guard, which he named after Caro Parisian, hence the K. A lot of people don't know that because Caro taught it to him, and he was like, I don't know what else to call this guard. I'll call it K for Caro. Um, but. Yeah, long legs, man. They they really make that a, a useful move. So, it's it's kind of a goofy looking guard. I mean, not not really. You're, you're just rolling over and kind of pushing the guy away with your legs. But yeah, I've had it for short of. legs. I remember uh, a small Craig Jones. Uh, yeah. What's his name? Small Craig Jones. Uh, Lake Langile. Yes. yes. Uh, he's the one who, who was like submitting like uh, a heavyweight in HDCC, Like got the the heel hook uh, using the setup, uh, the K guard setup. Yeah. And the guy's like, again, he's, he's, he's short, but the guy, like, uh, used it perfectly against guys that were, like, yes. 30 kilograms over him. And it's, it, it's funny, because, like, Neil Melanson, like, he, he teaches K-Guard predominantly to set up the, uh, the triangle choke. But I started playing around with it, and I'm like, wait, there's heel hooks here, there's transitions to knee bars, mm. you can go to the back. I think it's mostly uh, to attack the legs. Like, if you're a good uh, leg lockers, I think K-Guard can be, like, a good influence. But again, I don't know anything about Jiu-Jitsu, I'm a white belt, so... <laughs> he's... He's a white belt who beats all the white belts, man. <laughs> One day I would get a blue. One day. One day. Man, that's the thing with Jiu-Jitsu. You just keep going and eventually they have to give you the black belt. Eventually they do. I know, man. Like, uh, you know, Salo told me straight away, like, man, if you don't train at all, I cannot give you a blue belt. <laughs> no, I will have to. It's just like life I've been like you a bit keep challenging. You got That's, that's yeah. the part, man. The thing is, like, life was a bit challenging in, in China for me this last two years. So yeah. I didn't really have time to focus on stuff. I only go to jutsu competition uh, when I see there is one and I have time because it's fun and I like competing. But uh, I need to invest a bit of my time into learning jutsu because, again, I want to get better. I want to understand what I'm doing. Right now, what I do is mostly uh, instinct and things I see. And uh, I understand my body and how the human body works a bit. So... I know where to not put my hands or not put my head, 
but uh, I want to understand more what I'm doing for the simple reason that I want to be able to be a black belt one day, share the knowledge too, and yeah, just be better as a fighter, better as a person. So okay. man, that's with, uh, with that learn. fight IQ, man. If you if you really applied yourself, man, you could you could go places. One day. One day. But the great thing about jujitsu is, man, you can. And my, my friend Matt Grant had him on the podcast for, for everybody asking me, like, um, Ramsey, I'm an older guy. I'm over 40, over 50. I want to start jujitsu. Is this even possible? I always refer them to Matt Grant's podcast. He started jujitsu at the age of 51, and then he went on to become an IBJJF world champion in the, the master's division at age yeah, white belt, and then blue belt, and purple belt, and brown belt, all the way up to black belt. He's a black belt now. Look, Just received his black belt. Shout out to Matt Grant. Congratulations, by the way. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, there, there's nothing easy about it, obviously, of course, but the secret is you just keep going yeah. and you keep training and you just keep, uh, I hesitate to say grinding at it because that makes it sound like it's something unpleasant that you hate doing because if you hate doing it, why are you doing mm. jujitsu? I think you're still grinding because you, for me, that's why I respect people who have a real black belt and not like this fake ass, mm. uh, uh, blood belt you can have at the age of uh, six or that's why yeah. I have a lot of points with Taekwondo yeah. Karate there's so many so many uh, fake kind of black belt they give you like this fake sense of achievement when yes. actually a blind, black belt you have to go through a lot to deserve to get a black belt it's yeah, like I, I have a lot of respect for people who have Jiu-Jitsu black belt a Jules belt because they have religious skills it's something that they have to yeah. go through even through injury you're tired you don't want to go but you're still going I think everybody who um, who basically got a black belt in Taekwondo in the 90s or before that is just really pissed off at World Taekwondo today. That's what I mean. Be Taekwondo was something that was actually like a legit strong martial arts. Like fighting Taekwondo, it's something that's that's actually extremely effective. A lot of people um, take the piss at Taekwondo because they see the Olympic Taekwondo, ha ha ha, hee hee. Touch, touch, and uh, <laughs> that looked like it. <laughs> it's exactly what it looked like. Unfortunately, it's yes. like it's an aggressive way of doing uh, uh, cancan, uh, French cancan. So is that a dance? Yeah, the French cancan. You know, in the bar, like you know, when they move their leg, like. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think in English we call those go-go dancers, or I don't know. I need to find it, but yeah, I will show you after. But yeah, that's yeah. an aggressive way of French cancan. So, uh, when before, like taekwondo, like you can see uh, the old. Taekwondo style was looking a lot like uh, yeah the kick of Muay Thai or other martial arts. It was mm -hmm. like focused not on just scoring points and touching, but breaking someone's ribs. It was a deadly serious killing art, guys. Once upon a time, it yeah. wasn't always martial arts themed daycare. Mm -hmm. And we, we could see the decline of Taekwondo like that when it started to collide against Kyoku Shinkai Karate, for example. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of competition between the two arts, yeah. and they were just getting slaughtered by the Kyoku Shinkai guy because they're serious and they're low kicking yeah. the hell out of them and it was not about touching but about like yeah breaking someone's legs in half yeah that's interesting because like taekwondo and kyokushin especially at that time had very similar rules yeah exactly i mean uh, there's some subtle differences like uh i think in kyokushin at least back then you could do takedowns and strike the guy on the ground or do leg kicks but no no punch in the but face but yeah they yeah. have leg kicks they still have very kicks. similar rule sets yeah that's why they're colliding a lot but yeah it's yeah. Uh, unfortunately because of uh, what taekwondo like, became like yeah you can see kyokushin like was much more effective than taekwondo and like again it's uh, it's it's kind of sad to see the decline of martial arts sometimes yeah it has a lot to do with the mindset this and money because again like uh, the rules the rule set are gonna shape martial arts if for mm. example tomorrow in boxing um, body shots is what's going to score the most points, everyone is going to turn into body shotters. True. If it's about like, oh, uh, the jabs doesn't, doesn't score any points anymore, yeah, you're going to see less jabs. In yeah. Muay Thai, uh, uh, the, the rules in Muay Thai, and why it's called, for example, is so interesting is because sometimes, according to where you're going, um, the arena you're going to fight, for example, Lumpini, Rajanamnon, Omnoi, uh, TV7 or, or just like you know some uh, show, Muay Thai show like uh, Muay Thai Super Champ, Max Muay Thai, uh, one championship. The rules, the w the way it's gonna be uh, scored is totally different. Some are now gonna favor a clinch, some are now gonna favor a middle kick, and uh, you're gonna have to adapt your style uh, to match the criteria of that arena. That's why there is different style in Muay Thai, clinch yeah. style, strong with the hands, strong with the legs, and yeah. 
it's all it's all about the rule set your bout is gonna is gonna uh, end up with. I remember I had a, a K1 rules fight. I think it was my second K1 rules fight. But I had trained for this fight with with uh, Muay Thai fighters from Thailand, and I I basically clinched a lot, which you're not allowed to do in mm. K1. You can grab the guy, throw a knee, or throw a punch, yep. and then you have to let go right away. So I did a lot of that. Like you know, it's like I'm I'm. I feel really strong and confident in the clinch, so I'll grab him, I'll hit him, let go, and move on. And I ended up losing the decision, even though I landed the overwhelming majority of the strikes. And I was like, man, what gives? And afterwards, my coaches were like, well, if it was Muay Thai in Thailand, you would have won, but it's not, yeah, so I mean. you lost, sorry. Yeah. That's why, like, you know, we, uh, back home, like, you know, we have a lot of success. It's like, our guys can fight in any rule set, Muay Thai, kickboxing, uh, even uh, French uh, savate. It's uh, it's just about like you have your fight. You know that the way you're gonna have to fight is different. Yeah. Fighting in a show in Max Muay Thai and in uh, Thailand in uh, uh, Lumpini, two different things. Yeah. The arena, uh, the Max Muay Thai, for example, you're gonna have to put a lot of pressure. They want to see blood. They want to have like you know mm. KO and colliding. In Lumpini, it's more like yeah, slowly you want to score points. You want to uh, score a lot of middle kicks. Yeah. Uh, clinch is important. Something about knees, like, man, I've, I've only been to Lumpini Boxing Stadium, what's the old, the old stadium before they renovated it, and, man, every time they would clinch and throw the knees, the crowd would just go nuts. Is, is that like... Um, yeah, yeah, clinch is, clinch is important, and it's called, it's called points, like, clinch in Thailand, it's important. Yeah. The only place where you're not going to have too much people who are going to be crazy about clinch is going to be, like, in shows like, yeah, Max Muay Thai and, uh, and um, Super Champ, these kind of things. Even one one championship, they don't like it much. They want to have a show, it but in arena, like yeah, it's super important. It's really interesting to to notice what different audiences cheer for. Like in, in Lumpini, like the techniques that really impressed me. There was this one guy who was doing this great hand fighting and setting up his hooks to counter elbows in this very unique way I'd never seen. Dead silence. But as soon as they clinched and threw any, everybody went nuts. Yeah. I but think then, it's, yeah, it's yeah. mostly with betting because of betting. Because this is gonna, this is gonna, like you know, change the way of betting. And, and uh, points doesn't score, uh, hands doesn't score points in uh, in a stadium. Yeah, it's very very low uh, points. Knees do score a lot of points. Sweeps a lot of points. So yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. There there are a lot of folks who are who are not really well versed in in the rules of Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are familiar with Muay Thai because it's it's basically one of the one of the core disciplines of mixed martial arts, and that's really brought it to the public. Mm -hmm consciousness but um, there's a there's a rule in Muay Thai and I, I'm not sure if it's universal but uh, there was a video that was circulating where these two fighters are fighting it, this is a fight in Thailand dude gets a sweep and as his opponent is dropping he throws a head kick yep. this is fairly common to see in Muay Thai yep. and everybody starts screaming you can't throw head kicks to a downed opponent because that's a UFC rule mm. but as, as far as Muay Thai, as far as I'm aware, that's that's legal to throw the kick as the guy's dropping. So it's as long as the hand doesn't touch the ground. Yeah. As long as the, touch doesn't, the hand doesn't touch the ground, you can get kicked in the head. Yeah. So that's why you have, even sometimes, especially back in the days, less now, less now, but back in the golden area, if you land on your butt, even like, you know, uh, or one hand on the ground, you could get a penalty uh, soccer ball kick in your face and like, you know, yeah. yeah. It depends on the referee and uh, the place it goes, but Sometimes it will happen and it was fine. Mm. There is a, a, a huge, a wonderful sweep to a soccer ball kick that I will send you uh, after. Yeah. I think that was the most incredible one I saw in my life in Thailand, where the guy just like sweep the guy and before he landed on the ground, his head was first. He just like soccer ball kick him in the head while he was in the air. Oh, man. So sweep to soccer ball Perfect like timing. within the air. It was amazing. I never saw that before and I don't think I will ever see that again. Yeah, and this is a technique we, we yeah. never see in the UFC, first of all, because, you know, you can't head kick a downed opponent, yeah. but, but also just the, the timing, if we saw that in the UFC, even if it was a legit kick when he's not on the ground, they would still be like, let's see the slow yeah. motion replay. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. I so got me in the face. practice that. When I was 16, my, my first pro fight in Thailand, I got actually swept. And the guy just like knee me like straight in the face. Will I was down. I was I hand up in the corner yeah. and the guy just run and bah, knee me straight in the face. And uh, well, welcome to the sport of Muay Thai, yeah. right? <laughs> and I, I just take the impact. So my head goes in the corner and I just like the first thing I do is like 
I check uh, if my teeth are still there because yeah. I, I the he knee me so hard in the face that I, I thought like you know I was gonna spit my teeth I take a knee, are my teeth still here? so I'm like and then I was like motherfucker and I stand back up straight away I was like okay now it's dirty war it yeah. was a nice fight yeah I lost Rule on the number one of all fight. fighting protect yourself at all times protect yourself at all, all times. every time yeah I, I learned that day I was like Ooh, that didn't feel good I'm glad like my nose or my cheekbone and my teeth were fine uh, yeah man you're still beautiful thank goodness thanks <laughs> still got sliced later though but well but yeah man um and I was having this memory while we we're talking about surrounding ourselves with uh with certain types of training partners like uh five or six years ago I was training with a lot of Russian guys dudes from Russia oh. Ukraine Kazakhstan all these uh sambo fighters mm. Interesting thing about um, Russians in Shanghai, I noticed it's a very close knit community. Mm. And if they like your gym, they will invite their friends. Mm. Before you know it, you've got a dozen Russian <laughs> sambo fighters at your gym. And this was, this was a really interesting training time for me because they would always attack the legs, like relentlessly go for the straight ankle lock. And I wouldn't say it was a super developed uh, leg lock game that sambo guys have, but it's a super persistent leg lock game that they have. And so. I, I just got a lot better at defending straight ankle locks because they were always attacking that. You, you had to hide your feet or they would take it. And so I found myself, um, a couple years later, I went to a gym, a jiu-jitsu gym in America, in, in California. And this guy goes for a straight ankle lock and I fight it off and then I straight ankle lock him. I'm like, no big deal. And then he, f he starts flipping out and he's like, how did you do that? I'm like, what do you mean? Just straight ankle lock. He's like, but I'm the leg lock guy at this point. <laughs> like, like leg lock guy singular? Like nobody else does leg locks? <laughs> yeah, it's just me. I'm like, well, that's why. You've got to surround yourself with leg lock guys if, if you want to be, if you really want to be well versed at that technique mm. you want to learn. So, yeah, Go, going back to the grappling thing, uh, you, you're, you're basically like, you've become this integral part of the, the Shanghai mixed martial arts community um, and so how, how much of that is, is rubbing off on, on you as a, as a striking coach, if you will? Uh, it's been a while I didn't went to the PI because there was renovation and like most of the guy left. So not too much. When, I, when, when you say about that, it's more about like a grappling or because my grappling improved being in contact with those guys. But otherwise, yeah. like I didn't change much. The, the thing is... Uh, I feel in Shanghai, it's hard for me to, and it was already before, it's hard for me to find people to train with, hmm. to have fun with, sparring and things like that. Like, uh, if, uh, unless I go to PI, it, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit boring. This, this reminds me of a question I get a lot from uh, a lot of viewers, because some people, some people who follow my channel are actually fairly high level mixed martial mm -hmm. artists or, or fighters or kickboxers. And they're like, dude, I'm kind of stuck in a rut because like, not to brag, but everybody I train with is well below my level. Mm. How do I improve from here? And I've, I've, I've got some ideas for that, but I, I would be very interested to, to ask you, because again, Jawad is a very high level kickboxer, so what do you do to improve as a kickboxer? The, the thing that you should do to improve when it's like that is visit other academy, make friends, like, you know, that's the thing for me. That's, why, that's how you met in the beginning too. It's like, for me, when I first came in Shanghai, I didn't know anyone. I didn't yeah. know anyone. So I went to, uh, I asked, what's the strongest gym in this, what, what's the place where they have the best fighter in this uh, city? And people told me, oh, Dragon Warrior. So I went there. Uh, then, like, you know, I ended up in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Warzone. And uh, what I was doing is I wanted to visit every single gym and find other people to spar with. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to striking, some people doesn't perceive that well when you go to their gym because they... They think you're like dojo crushing. Yeah, or, the dojo storm. Yeah, dojo storming, or they don't want to look bad, even though like it's okay to not be the best. Like you know, it's yeah. it's okay to find someone that's gonna best you in technique, in in, in height, in weight. It, it's fine. But uh, visiting other gym, um, being introduced to other gyms where they have bigger guys, for example, um, it's a great way to to to. To go over that stop gap that uh, someone is facing again, finding someone that's bigger than you is a good way mm -hmm. to start. Because if someone gives you 20 kilograms, you're gonna have to rethink like the way you're you're attacking that person. Like like it happened to me in the PI when yeah. I was sparring um, with that guy. I forgot his name, but uh, 
he's like 110 uh, kilogram the guy is like super big uh, sanda guy and the first time i spar with him the guy go for like uh, sidekick and i know sanda 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 fighter have great sidekicks so normally i'm always the tallest and kind of biggest uh, at the pi but this guy was like yeah, bigger than me much bigger than me and um I take the first side kick, the first three side kicks, and I'm like, "Fuck, I cannot stay in front of that guy." Like, you know, it's uh, yeah. it's too strong for me to just like take it uh, in the front. So second round, I had to start to f change my way of sparring with this guy. So again, blocking with the knees, wheel circling around, and um, hard boxing him and hard kicking him from the outside. And then I didn't had any more problem with that guy, but. I had to find a solution because it was a new problem. The guy is yeah. bigger than me. Much bigger I, I know than exactly me. who you're talking about. When I sparred with my, I had to bow so. out. It was just too much. But uh, so yeah, if if you spar with someone bigger than you, taller than you, you're gonna have new sets of problems to fix. And then like it's it's gonna okay. You're gonna take a bit of time, find those problems, and get better than them. And or or you're gonna be stuck here for a while. And step by step, you're gonna improve. Asking help, uh, asking their asking help, asking your coach. Oh, I had this problem. What can I do? And you're gonna have to try and try and try again. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think going to other academy um, with good intents always because uh, yeah. some people they visit other academy but with bad intents because of ego. Uh, when you have good intents, people usually they are happy to share. That's why I I, uh, I, I have in my plans to visit more the north of China because I want to visit some of this academy. I know there is some yeah. maybe some strong guys that uh, I some don't even know how. Yeah, so. I want to go there, visit Academy, and yeah, fun, sharing. I think it's, again, martial arts is always about sharing. Sharing is caring. So that's how you can make bonds with people. Yeah, man, like uh, the Xi'an University of Sport, there's some really good uh, Sando dudes mm. out there, big yeah. guys too. But uh, yeah, w one thing I've noticed about you, and, and I think I think it's one of the reasons why, why you are one of the best kickboxers that I met is because you're not content to be the big fish in the small pond. I uh, know. Like you, you go out into the ocean looking for the sharks, basically. That's why I like Jiu-Jitsu. That's why I like MMA. Because again, on my two legs, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be the strongest guy in this city. But then, if you only do boxing, I get my ass kicked by 70 kilogram guys. When I only do yeah. boxing, only with my hands, 70 kilogram guys are like a pain in the ass for me because like they're fast, they have some good head movement. Yeah. Uh, grab, like if I do a Jiu-Jitsu, man, guys are like purple bear, yeah. Even some blue, like, you know, sometimes I get tapped, like, you know, by good blue belt. It's like, I'm a white belt. So there is yeah. tons of guys that's going to squeeze my neck and uh, fold me in half. Boxing, there is a lot of guys that are going to hard box me. They are going to be uh, sleek with their movement. Um, but then as soon as I, yeah, I start to add legs, like, yeah, it's... Or as soon as I can do something more than just boxing, using the elbow, for example. Yeah, but that's why I like to feel challenged. I like to find a, a situation and I'm like... Damn, what do I do now? Yeah. It's 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 not fun to yeah, to just be content of oh I'm the strongest in my gym, so what? Exactly. And I got a really long letter from a, a subscriber of recently and he basically said, you know, I I wanna be the big fish in the small pond. It makes me feel good about myself and I, I understand that. It's 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 not the way to grow, but yeah. I understand that sentiment. He's like, but you know, some tougher guys came and they they showed me up and I don't feel good about it. It, it destroyed my mm. ego. What do I do? Ah, ego. And it, it reminded me of an experience I had recently. I was rolling with my friend Carlos. You know, he's a jiu-jitsu brown belt. Very good. He kicks my butt like nine times out of ten. <laughs> and he wasn't feeling well that day. Like he was very low energy, dehydrated, having muscle cramps. And I'm rolling with him and I realize something's off and I catch him with a straight ankle lock and, you know, a position he, he can normally just escape from very easily. And he taps out, I'm like, man, well, you, you doing okay? He's like, ah, I'm not feeling so, so good today. And I'm like, oh man, I want to beat you, but not like this. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, if you have this mentality of I just want to win, I just want to be the big fish in the small pond, again, it's ex incredibly limiting and that's all yep. you're ever going to be. <clears throat> if, if, like I said before, if, if you go out into the ocean looking actively for the sharks, on the other hand, man, that's the growth mentality that you need. I totally agree with that. It's, the thing is, again, like a lot of people are not going to take that in a kind way. For example, like I know that there is some people that don't want me to go to their gym because they are students and because they know that, you know, you know I spar in a kind of light way, unless people want to 
go to war like I'm to, I am happy to do so but uh, when I spar with people they some sometimes people can think it's a bit uh, humiliating because of the technique I use or the way I yeah. spar when I'm always smiling and <laughs> for me I'm having a good time when I spar with someone I'm having yeah. a good time if I'm not smiling it's because yeah I start to be serious and mm. I, I'm I'm not happy with something you did so if he's not smiling in the ring, watch out. Yeah, just like, yeah, if, if usually, like, I'm not smiling and I'm having a stern fence, I'm going to, it's me that I try to enjoy you. It's yeah. me, like, you try to do something dirty on me and I'm, I'm, going, I'm going at you. But otherwise, like, for me, I'm always trying to have fun. When I spar with someone, when I'm uh, sharing with someone, again, it's, it's sharing. I do it because, yeah, it's fun. You can meet a lot of great, like, I met you like that. And, you know, you can meet a lot of nice people, like, by uh, uh, exchanging and sparring with them and... Uh, um, I remember last time uh, last time I went actually to another gym was at Fei Tiger and I went to actually crush the gym I went yeah. to beat up the coaches <laughs> yeah. so a very funny story like uh, one of my friends uh, who's only doing boxing uh, went that to that open session it's an yeah. open session on Saturday uh, to have sparring and he was talking with some of the girls uh, of the gym and you know normal conversation mm -hmm. and uh, one of the coach Thai coach it's a, it's a gym only with uh, Thai coaches the biggest Thai coach uh, took him and made the um, example out of him. Hmm. So my friend is like uh, this white guy, 70 kilogram, nice guy, like, you know, he's doing boxing, but not Muay Thai. And this guy was like 85 kilograms and it just went ham on him. Okay. Like he literally like beat him up in front of everyone, just, just for sure. Hmm. And uh, to the point where like, you know, at some point he just like crossed him so hard, he punched him in the cheekbone and my friend so black. And after that, he had a headache for a week. And uh, just by talking about some um, Muay Thai and stuff like that, he told me the story. And I was like, yeah. what? I was That's like, okay, where man. is this? And he's like, oh, it's uh, Fei Tiger uh, next. I'm like, oh, it's an open sparring session. And then he's like, yeah. Yeah, I so, got to say about Tiger Muay Thai, all the good coaches left that gym a long time ago. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, great. So I took a day off. I, uh, I uh, asked work, like, you know, take a day off. And I went there. And the coach was there. Yeah. So, well, uh, when I went there, like, uh, prepared myself and I was like staring actively to that coach because I really want him to understand that I was not here to play. I was here to beat mm. him up. And uh, so this actually was kind of a dojo storm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it was literally a dojo storm. Like, you know, I came like, this guy's not going to go out of his two legs out of his gym for sure. So because if you want to bully someone that's like 15 kilogram less, uh, less than him, let's see how I fare with someone that's 10 kilogram heavier than him. So there is this other two coach, very s small Thai coach, yeah. uh, Chat Noi, and uh, I forgot the name of the other one. And um, Chat Noi was actually a champion. And when they do the sparring, this, the bigger coach start to do pad work with another student. So I mm. had to spar with the two small Thai coach. And we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Again, uh, they were like 60, 60 something kilograms. So we're playing around. I let them do some things. You know, I work on some. We're having fun. And at the end of the sparring, I asked them, because, you know, I, I can speak Thai a bit. I asked them, like, if uh, the other coach is not sparring. And they're like, why? I'm like, because I, I came for him. Hmm. And I, uh, I told him, like, put your gloves on, spar with me. I was like, you can spar with small guy. Let's see how you do it with me. But I'm sending you to the hospital. <laughs> Fair warning. I told him, like, it's not a spar. Like, you know... You elbow, no elbow, shin guard, no shin guards. You take the glove you want, let's go. Mm. And uh, the two other Thai coach were like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> and he looked at me and he's like, Medai, I'm like, no. Mm. And then I, I, I stayed a bit longer and I told them like, look, I've been training in Thailand, in Jinmoy, on Pet City. I went to so many different gym. I never saw this kind of behavior. When someone comes to your gym and you do this kind of bullying just to yeah. show off, I never saw this kind of, uh, of behavior. It's like, it's, I, for me, this was first very insulting, dangerous, and it shows that you don't have any consideration for people who are under you. So I'm like, I, I really want him to understand that in this city, if you do this kind of behav behavior, if you have this kind of behavior, people are connected. Yeah. If like, you know, you beat up one of my friends, I will be back, I will come and see like you know what you're gonna be able to do yeah it's a big city but it's a very close-knit it's a big city community. very small community and after that he went to my friend and apologized he went to him and he was like yeah i apologize sorry about that he understood okay. what he did 
He understood that what he did was wrong. It was bullying. It, again, for me, there is nothing better than bully, bully. Mm. If you're a bully, you're always going to have a bigger bully that's going to come and put you in your place. Yeah. And usually, it's me. Well, that's, that's <coughs> cool that, uh, that you got the apology and you didn't actually have to beat yeah. the crap out of him. As satisfying as that would have been to see. But I told him, I told him if you ever do that again to anyone I know, I'm not asking you to spar, you're not leaving your gym. Like, for sure, I will send you to the hospital for a long time. And for me, that's, that's the way it should be done. Like, you know, martial arts, you have to protect people. My yeah. father always told me, don't be a wolf, don't be a sheep, be a shepherd. Protect people. It's like, if people are weak, don't take advantage. If people, like, you know, they're new, or don't be there, like, you know, bullying him. Help them to grow. Help them to rise above, like, you know, what they are. And don't that's, be a wolf, don't be a sheep, yeah. be a shepherd. I like that. No, but cool, I think people should apply that in everything they do in life. Like, you know, if you have the advantage, un unless it's business. <laughs> so if you, have the, if you have more experience, if you know, like, you know, you're much better than someone who's just starting and just want to be part of, for example, you can be part of a community. Yeah. You come to a sparring uh, gym, like, you know, it must be your first contact with this gym. You just want to be part of a community, being recognized by people. If you do that to someone and you put them in the ground and like, you know, you make them have a concussion. What kind oh, of yeah. what kind of picture do you show of your gym of yourself and the? It's Indeed, it's there, there is a huge responsibility on a on a coach. Of course, because often the coach is like, not always, but often the coach is the best fighter in the room. This this happens at a lot of mm -hmm. gyms, and the coach has the most capacity to inflict damage, and these students are putting them their trust in this coach. Yep. Teach me, don't hurt me, yep. and you know when I when I spar with my students a lot, and you guys come in the gym all the time you know, unathletic nerds who get picked on and they want to learn how to fight to protect themselves or feel, feel better about themselves. Mm. And I get on the mat with them and, oh man, if, if I hurt them, not only, not only would I betray their trust, it, man, I, I couldn't sleep at night. Exactly, you would feel like I, shit. I couldn't live you with myself. You would feel like shit, like, Doing that on purpose. You do this on purpose to someone who's like really well under you, and you should be some kind of slime ball. Like it's like, unless you're someone that get your rocks off on that, it's like, damn, it must be living a pretty miserable life to do these kind of things to someone just because yeah. you can. That's the thing I like with jiu-jitsu. It's like since it's it's dangerous technique, it's locked. It's like basically someone's gonna break your arm if you don't tap. Uh, with jiu-jitsu, you actually have the capacity of like humbling someone without hurting them or make them understand like you know yeah. how superior you are without actually harming them in any way and I think that's great because yeah. you can show off if you want you can uh, do a berimbolo uh, make them flip over and spin around but at the end of the day the guy's just gonna be like oh, how did you do that and yeah. not like oh my head is hurting my ribs are hurting and I feel I'm gonna I'm gonna die yeah so that's the great thing with Jutsu that's something I like I mean, it gives you options to show off or not. Like, take for example the heel hook. A lot of people don't, like, new students don't understand why the heel hook is dangerous because it doesn't hurt until you tear up the knee. <laughs> Unless you pop your knee. And so there's some mild pressure and they're like, it doesn't hurt so I don't need to tap. So they don't know they should tap out, right? Mm. So when I, when I roll with a new guy and I get a heel hook, I just hold it and then I release and I try for something else. And I don't mm. need him to know that, oh, I won, I got you. Yeah. I, I don't care. You know, maybe later on I'll explain how a heel hook works yeah. so he doesn't get caught with him so often, but you know, I, don't need, I don't need that power. No, trip. of course not. Or like one of my favorite techniques, the suplex. <laughs> potentially I'm not going to slam a new student in a suplex just because I can. <laughs> his neck, yeah. I'll get his back and then I'll do oh like God. a slower, safer mat return or something like that. But <laughs> suplex. I'll save the, the suplexes for the for the streets. dummies. No, yeah. the suplex is for the streets. For the streets. <laughs> Streets. <laughs> it's oh, like a God. fatality right there on the streets. <laughs> Man. Oh, yeah, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think like it, it's important to, to help people to build confidence and not crush people's confidence just because, like, oh, you want to look like the top dog. Yeah. And again, mostly those people who do that, when there is a bigger fee than them in the room, they change, they don't go hard anymore. Yeah. They, they don't go hard anymore. Like they can control, they play, ha ha, ho oh, ho, he he, because they're they're afraid of violence. It's yeah, like it you know that if you go hard on that big ass guy that looks scary and that's heavier than you, 
you know that yeah, you're not going to have a good day at the office. So straight, straight away, like, ah, now I'm playing. Yeah. And that's, that's why I always make it a point. When, when you guys come in, I will always spar with the new students first to check a few things. One, you know, if they're going to, if they're tame enough to set loose on the rest of the class, basically. And, you know, two, if, if somebody's going to get hurt, I would rather have it be me than one of my students. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always there to, you know, essentially to check them mm. and, and let them know this is the way we spar. We're not, we're not going to fight. Yep. We're not going to injure each other here. Uh, we had discussion about sparring before, actually, about hard and light sparring. I, I believe, like, hard sparring is going to be important sometimes, but, like, again, targeted uh, area. But, yeah, mostly it's, it's about playing. Mm. But I, I still believe that contact is going to be a bit important because some people are going to be amazing in theory. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they get a bit roughed up, they lose the quality of the technique. Yeah. And they're going to have to get used to this uh, um, roughing up, uh, you know, the increase of the intensity and still keeping the quality of the technique, keeping their cool. But that's something you build step by step. It's not something you just like throw someone in the lion's den and see if they, are, if they survive. Yeah, man, with, with almost every fighter, there's a remarkable difference between how they perform in the gym and how they perform in a fight. And of it's course. Usually like much, much lower of course. In, the, in the fight. Like in a recent podcast with uh, George St. Pierre he, and John Danaher. Danaher said, uh, you know, in the, as of remarkable as George St. Pierre was in his UFC fights, he was so much better in the gym. Mm. And I absolutely believe that because it's true with everybody that I've ever seen, myself totally included, true. in the gym. It's, it's just a different story. It's a different pressure, different mm. intensity. Yeah, different mindset. Totally agree with this, and some people's style are not uh, suitable for the gym either. Mm -hmm. Like I have some friends that their style is just like Rafael, for example, like block, push forward, and just blast you like you know as hard as he can, and he have endless cardio. He cannot do that in the gym. Yeah. So his technique is not amazing, but he have bottomless cardio. He have a heavy shit, solid chin, and he can hit like a ton of brick. So yeah. his style is not like perfect for the gym. Or a technic technician uh, style would be more suitable for, for sparring, for the gym, etc. Yeah, so man. it depends on your style too. This and you don't have that pressure in the gym. There's somebody out there watching this right now who's stuck around this long thinking, yeah, that's when my style is for the streets, not yeah, for the gym. Exactly, it's for <laughs> the streets. Oh my God. You know, something that's funny and that I really find is very funny is like when people think that martial arts, Jiu-Jitsu, I like the Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu is like, Oh, but you cannot kick, your, it's useless because, oh, I can grab your nuts or I can poke your eyes. Oh, but they really don't imagine one second that someone who do jiu-jitsu can actually grab your nuts and poke your eyes or bite yeah. you. And it's do it like, better because they're in a dominant it's position. Like, like, again, same for Muay Thai or anything. Oh, in Krav Maga or whatever, Bushido, like, oh, I poke your eyes, I bite you, and I, I use, like, the double tiger slap to make you deep and uh, spit in your eyes. But it's something that I can do too. Like I can kick you in the yeah. nuts, bite you, or spit in your eyes and go for a double leg, or throw some uh, some pepper in your eyes or some magic powder. It's it's something that we can do too. We just yeah, like exactly. we choose not to do it and because you, there is rule sets. And you can do it better. I mean, yeah. think about the groin shot, for example. Um, who is going to be better at landing the groin shot? The the couch potato, who theorizes. And doesn't spar, or the guy who's really good at landing the inside leg kick, My and just aiming a tiny bit higher. <laughs> One day we had a guy, uh, Rafael, who had a fight at night in the subway with two guys, and he whooped their ass, but he, he broke his uh, knuckle. And my father was like, "Are you dumb? Why did you punch someone in the face, uh, like in the head?" He's like, "Kick them in the nuts." And he had like we had like a one-hour class only on nut kick, karate nut kick. Like, and you learn that you should not kick with a straight leg in the nuts, but you have to kind of keep your leg a bit bent to more like cup the, the groin with, your, with the neck of the feet. Interesting. So we had a full class on nut shots. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you don't do nut shots in the ring unless you're really tired and you say sorry just after. Exactly. Oh, man, there's the rules and then there's the rules, man. I, I made Always a video cheat. about this that made thousands of people very angry. Always um, cheat if you can. Just don't get caught. And... Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you go out there and cheat. I'm just telling you what actually happens in <laughs> combat sports. Yeah. Like, there's the rules, and then there's what actually happens. Like, man, a groin kick, if, if you make it look like an accident, 
and you say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. Mm. You can buy yourself a five-minute break. The other guy gets a five-minute break. You can win too. a fight like that. My brother lost a fight to yeah. a nut shot yeah. against Pejam. He whooped Pejam's ass. The guy kicked him in the groin so hard. He spent four days in the hospital with like yeah. testicle raptor, and the guy won the fight. And statistically speaking, it's like I, I can't think of a single fight off the top of my head where a guy took a legitimate groin shot and then made a comeback after that. It's hard. It's, it's hurt. Extremely difficult. This like there is like. Um, uh, Nut kicking, spitting mouth guard, like uh, there is a lot of small dirty moves that are that are totally part of a fight. So now you know it's like it's just like you know one of the ropes that people don't see much in boxing. It would be for example like rabbit shot or yeah. a kidney shot. This kind of like small thing, uh, hitting with the shoulder. It's like small thing that are not or stepping on, stepping on the feet, yeah. stepping on the feet to see someone's movements. It's not clean. It's not, but it's effective. Yeah. And it's part of the game. You gotta have to play. Like, don't hate the player, hate the rules. Yeah, it's, it's part of the game. It is about the rules. Like, and this, this is a story I told that made a lot of people angry. And people were like, I'm unsubscribing from your channel because you're evil now. No. Oh. My, uh, I had this kickboxing match. It was the first kickboxing match that I won. <laughs> I, I lost a few. I got beat up a little bit. And evil. then I had this uh, this coach. His, his fight nickname was No Mercy. No Mercy, Jeff No Mercy Moody. And the guy's just crowding me, getting really close, just throwing like wild flurries. And it's a kickboxing match, so no knees. And he tells me, he does that again, knee him straight in the groin. And I'm like, but that's illegal. Kickboxing, like, you had no knees? Yeah, no knees. Really? Uh, it was uh, like American kickboxing. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so no knees. Strange rules. And so that's illegal. And he says, the referee's going to give you a warning. And if you do it again, he'll deduct a point. Those are the rules. I'm like, okay. So the guy starts crowding me, and I throw a knee. I don't throw it at the groin. I throw it at the body, and I push, but I throw it hard. And the referee's like, no knees, continue. I'm like, holy crap, that actually worked. And the guy no longer swarms me, no longer gets in close, respects the distance after that, and I end up winning the fight, second round technical knockout. And I tell this story, and everyone's like, you're a dirty fighter, you're evil, I hate your guts. I'm like, well, there's the rules, and then there's the rules, right? The rule is, if you throw a knee, you get a warning. And that's it. That's the consequence. So I suffered the consequence. The referee wagged his finger at me. I know. I know. It's, it's probably not the way you should want to win, but those are the rules. That's how it is. Again, like... And again, it's, it's, it's not... It's unwritten, like, you know, uh, rules in the ring, like, where... For example, if you do something dirty to me, I have one shot of doing something dirty to you. Yeah. And it's... It goes it's, both ways. It's like, it goes both ways. Like, you know, again, if I do something, like, need you in the nuts, one time or two times, I'm going to expect to take one in return. And, like, and the referee is not going to say anything about it. Yeah. It, it goes both ways. Uh, you have one shot, we have one shot. Then after, if you continue, then it can ex escalate. It, uh, but it's not written. It's just an agreement between fighters. Yeah, it's very important for fighters to understand um, like Dutch Glove, for example. what a foul is, what a flagrant foul is, yeah. which fouls will cause instant disqualifications, yeah. which ones get a warning, which ones get a point deduction, because those are the actual rules yeah. of the sport. It's not just a list of things you can and can't yeah. do. It's the list of consequences for those actions mm -hmm. that you need to be mindful of. But rule number one, as I said before, protect yourself mm -hmm. at all times, because the referee won't do it. I mean, he's, he's there to stop the fight if it gets too intense, but he's not there to stop you from getting kicked in the mm. groin or poked in the eye. Yeah. This and that's why, like, same for the touch gloves. Touching gloves, you have yes. to be careful when you touch gloves because yes. you don't have to touch gloves. Like, you know, the referee asks you if you want to touch gloves before the fight, once the gong starts, it's on. Yeah. If you want to Come extend your hand and take a counter, it's your problem. It's not... It's... it's In the fighter code, we touch gloves normally unless... But some people use that to get you. You extend uh, and then they get you, and it's 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 fair. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Another rules, very important. Oh, man, I'm so glad you brought this up because, uh, man, I made a whole video about this that again made people very angry because the oh, referee it's... again before the fight happens there is the ceremony of love you. touch if you want to yeah. or shake hands or whatever, yeah. right? And then, why do we need to spend the first 10, 15 seconds of the fight doing that all over again in the middle of the match? And then have these controversial, you know, sucker punches or whatever after the referee says fight. I mean, that, that's just dumb. It's dumb in every way. There's no reason for it. I think it's against people, uh, people emotions are like, oh, that's dirty. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's smart.
Who, who was that guy um, fought Floyd Mayweather and did a headbutt? Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot his and, name. Uh, everybody forgets his name. Yeah, he got smoked. But Ooh. we remember Floyd. And then afterwards, he comes out acting all apologetic, like, oh, bro, it's okay, let's Yeah, you hugged him. And you hugged him. Hug. And, this is after and when you came out to hug, fight. yeah, yeah. And then Floyd knocks him out, and everyone's like, oh, Floyd's a dirty fighter because yeah. he threw a sucker punch. No. The referee said, fight. Floyd followed the instructions. Yeah. He followed the rules. The guy yeah. hugged him, and as soon as he came out of the hug, like, he just went like, who, who can, like, yeah. go to sleep. That was fight time, not hug time. Yeah, right? yeah. No, I agree, I agree, I agree. And I'm not a fan of Floyd because uh, of the per, the, oh, his personality, but was like, he was right. Yeah. Mm. Especially, like, the guy headbutted him before, like, two, three times, so. Yeah, Mayweather versus Ortiz. That was the fight. Yeah, you gotta expect it. Man, I'm glad you brought that up. Every time this happens, it turns into a controversial thing on the internet. People talk about it. They, they make their money chatting about it yeah. on, on their vlogs. But uh, I, I teach dirty stuff to my students, like, to be honest. Like, I, I te because, again, it's all about... It's part of the game. It's like you're going to know how to do it and how to defend against it. That's why I teach people, oh, when you defend the hook, try to cup the back of your hair because people will rabbit punch you. If they're yeah. smart, I will, I will do it. They will hit the back I of the get the hook and I will hit the back of your head and like, and the referee not always sit. It's yeah. hard to sit sometimes, so. There's also a legal and illegal way to hit the back of the head. Like if, if you just break the guy's posture and start hammer fisting the yeah. back of his head, okay, I'll But when you go for a large hook and just slightly give that small like hook, this is gonna, and usually when people yeah. hate it about that, they do the chicken dance like this. Because yeah. the, 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 I, don't, I forgot what's Dutch, but like it's uh, it's the kind of the spine, or but it's your nerve are like firing up in every like a Christmas tree. Yes. You have to learn how to do this and how to defend against it. Also throwing the throwing the head kicks, um, several different head kick varieties. You're very good at this, like your yeah, ghost kick, yeah. where the foot kind of comes up from behind, yeah, the, behind the neck, the back of the head. Yeah. Yeah. There's also like a really short range hook kick. I, I yeah. like to use it. But um, this is illegal, though. I guess you can actually hit the back of the head. And this this is actually legal because because it's um, it's the leg, <laughs> not the hand. Basically, in the stand up portion of the fight, if you're throwing a kick and it clubs the guy in the back of the head, okay, that's fine. You know, if if you have him pinned up against the turnbuckle with his back turned, you start. Yeah, 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 that's, that's yeah. different, right? Yeah. But yeah, it's funny because I, I remember like when I did that to Z, the when I had my last fight in Shanghai, and. Um, after the second knockdown, uh, I finished the guy with the ghost kick on the back of the head, and uh, and this guy I thought he was gonna die, like because he, he fainted in the in the changing room. You were there uh, actually. Yes. You were there, and uh, he fainted in the changing room after puking, and he was rushed to the to the ER. And I remember Kyle being like super yeah. stressed about it. Just like one one clean kick, man. And uh, yeah, because you hit someone in the back of the head, it's like it's. It's dangerous, but it's legal and it's very effective. So you have to know how to use thing and how to defend against this technique. It's it's very important. Yeah. Like again, kidney punch the same in boxing. It's illegal, mm -hmm. but it happen. It does. Kidney, uh, kidney does punch. Mean the body's right there. You yeah. go for the <coughs> body. The guy turns at an angle. You exactly. Get it. So or oh, for spinning back kick. If I spinning back kick you and I get the hook like same, you're gonna get it in the kidney. It's also you're gonna have to learn. Striking the throat. <coughs> like there's there's an express rule written in most combat sports: no striking the throat. <coughs> but there's a by rule in mixed martial arts anyway. In the stand up portion of a fight, if a if a strike lands to the throat, it's inconsequential. Doesn't happen much though. It's it's yeah. rare and it's. Mostly, unless you really get punched in the trough, like you know, mostly with people are tense and they get hit in the neck, yeah. not too much in the trough, but yeah, this can still happen. That's it true. does. Yeah. It yeah. just it's part of the fight. That's why rule number one, protect yourself at all mm. times. You know, <coughs> chin down, yeah, forehead agree. forward, hands up, that mm. sort of stuff. Right? Even when you end up on the ground. And you've, you've probably seen, um, you've probably seen that fight. I, I don't remember who it was, but the guy goes out and he's like, crawling on the ground like oh you can't touch me because because the rules <laughs> magical beast. you can't do the, the <laughs> you can't kick the head of a down opponent the guy just kicks him anyway and knocks him out and he gets disqualified but the other dude went to the hospital was it worth it hmm. no man. Well, for me if you if you lose a fight like that you didn't lose if the guy's sleeping you win no matter what he says like a dq a dq loss is not a loss yeah for this kind of because again if you if it's an accident, but this kind of stuff, if you're playing dumb, again, play dumb game, win dumb prize. So. Exactly. If if you got badly hurt, you didn't win no matter what the yeah. results say. Exactly. So, yeah. Man. Actually, one moment.
Making sure it's still on. Making sure it's still yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, Because, uh, yeah, sometimes it I had cut a off and with I the can't. camera once. I did, like, this two-hour podcast. And, and they off. recorded the first 30 minutes. And then I was like, no, all the good stuff happened after oh. the 30-minute mark. And that's why you have two cameras right now. That's why I got two case. cameras. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Also Same two one. angles. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a lot of... Uh, but, again... I really believe it's because people are emotional and they, are, they don't really know what it is to be in a fight. Um, again, fighting, it's not like, you know, like a match. Like, again, I like the Jiu-Jitsu, Jiu-Jitsu matches. Do some matches. It's like it's a match. There is, even like that, there is still like some dirty stuff that happened, but it's a match. In a fight, it's a fight. Like every kind of advantage I'm going to have on you, of course I'm going to try to exploit it. It's a fight. Uh, it's... Yeah, this is... Here's something I want to talk about. There, there are a lot of folks uh, in martial arts communities across all styles who have this idea of a true martial artist. And I think what they really mean by that is, is a good person. <laughs> yeah. And they will, they will hear a discussion like this where we're talking about exploiting rules or understanding rules, and, and it sounds like cheating, and it sounds like evil, and it sounds like bad and wrong stuff. And they will say, a true martial artist oh, would yeah. never do that. Or a true martial artist acts this way. And they, they explain like some idealized version of the code of Bushido that never even existed yeah, in, yeah. in Edo, Japan back in the day. Um, but <laughs> a true martial artist. What, what is a true martial artist, Jawad? Well, the, to begin with, they have to understand like, that martial arts has been made for strong people to beat up uh, more people. It's not like, oh, the weak to defend against the strong, that's bullshit. Someone that trained martial arts usually is strong and you just want to get stronger. Uh, to, well, to be even stronger and be them more people. That's always been the goal of martial arts. Uh, the Gracies show it quite well when they had Jiu Jitsu. They were going to other uh, gyms, closing the door, beating everyone up. And that's how they became famous. Uh, yeah. All the judo, all karate, all the different styles always conflicted against each other because my martial arts is the true martial arts. Everything else is trash. So they had to duck it out. It was not about like uh, ping pong or shifumi, rock, paper, scissors. No, it was about fighting and who's going to be the strongest. That's what MMA is amazing. Yeah. And martial arts and martial artists always been driven by the quest of power. It's not like, you know, Zoro defending the orphans and the widow. Uh, it's about power. Martial artists are selfish. And again, you have to be selfish to be a strong martial artist. You have to think about yourself. If you want to be uh, true, be Buddhist, uh, go in the mountain, uh, live on a rock, and, uh, uh, I don't know, pray uh, to uh, whoever divinity you believe, and uh, do charity, and, like, yeah, you're, you will be, like, you know, a great human being. You will be a great person, but... To be a great martial artist, you have to be strong and you have to win against people. Yeah. Involving violence. So I know that's this is gonna upset a lot of people, but But that's true. That's Again the term martial arts in the English language actually originated from from old English sword fighting manuals. Like I, I don't remember who was the first one, it was like in the sixteen hundreds, I think. But you know, guys like George Silver who wrote about sword fighting, mm -hmm. did a treatise on the rapier <laughs> and so on. Like, these are the guys who introduced the term martial arts to the English well, language. And these guys were killers who killed people with swords. Exactly, because martial and art, martial mean war. Like, yeah. martial, mars, it's war. It's yeah. the art of war. Literally, a martial artist is art like, yeah, war. it's it's art of war. And war were fought, like, you know, war is not with water gun and stuff. No, it was sword, it was rocks, it was... And that's, that, that's why most of the style before had weapon in uh, included uh, including Muay Thai Muay Thai Muay Boran they had swords like you know Krabi Krabong mm -hmm. uh, you know Muay Thai uh, Muay Boran Krabi Krabong kind of the same they had swords they have weapon why? because they were fighting wars yeah. it was not uh, punches and stuff it was part of it but all of the ancient martial arts have a weapon in it Karate uh, they had uh, they had uh, uh, yeah. what I all of the all martial artists have weapon in it because it was meant to kill people. Yeah, and this is <coughs> this is not well known in the modern world, but uh, if you look at the indigenous martial arts of the entire world, like closed fisted punching is really a rarity that we only see in a handful of styles. It's like brutal. boxing, um, you know, karate, wing chun and a few others. 
almost every style doesn't focus on this because the idea is you're holding weapons in your hands. This and the hands are brittle, like you know, it's even back day in ancient Greece, the cestus, uh, when they had the pugila. Yes. Uh, it was a cestus, they had literally brass knuckle on their hands. Yeah, basically a metal boxing a glove. A metal boxing glove, like you know, with like to protect their hands. So, yeah, it, it's, it was not all about shit and jiggles. Like a lot of people, again, they have this romance idea of a martial artist. If you want to have like, you know, the, a, a nice spirit, someone that's elevate himself as a human being and do good, you can do this while being a martial artist. And usually that's what martial arts nowadays is used for, you know, to help people who lost their way. Uh, again, my father is doing that for more than 40 years with my uncle, helping people that's uh, been hard doing drugs or youth that's been criminals. Yeah. And martial arts was a way of, um, of setting them back into society, put them back in the right path. Yeah. So it's been used that way. But it's not because of martial arts itself, it's because like my father used that as a medium to make the kids go back into, uh, exactly. and make them belong to, to something. But it's not about martial arts, it's about who you are while having martial arts. Again, when you have, uh, when you carry power, you have different way of using it for good, for bad, but again, nothing is really black or white. It's a mix of gray, like my hoodie. True, man. W when you have a positive role model as a martial arts <coughs> instructor or coach, I mean, that, that can be extremely transformative, especially exactly. to young people. You can see Cus D'Amato, you can see so many people that got their life saved uh, thanks to martial arts and thanks to the men uh, that helped them to discover martial arts and make them yeah. their patient. People that had nowhere to go, nowhere to look to look for in the future and in the end of the day like you know they became the best version of themselves they became someone new someone that yeah changed their own life but it's not because of martial arts itself it's because of the human behind so yeah. having the spirit of a martial artist doesn't mean doesn't mean shit yeah, it's, it's it's funny I'm, i would be really interested where this where this idea of martial artist means good person came from maybe hollywood uh. Hollywood, probably, yeah, martial arts Probably movies. Hollywood, Most from likely. karate movie. And like, like the Karate Kid, probably. I'm Mr. Miyagi was noble. Yeah, like. I'm pretty sure like this nobility things come from, uh, because if they read like ancient text or like, you know, uh, they would be like, oh, those people were savage, oh, they were murdering oh, yeah. each other in bouts, what the hell? You read about uh, Miyamoto Musashi, I mean. Yes, Musashi. He or wasn't a nice guy. He killed yeah. people, he murdered people. This he, he, he cheated, if you will. He didn't yeah. abide by the rules. Oh, yeah, Mus Musashi is a great example, actually. He but pissed his opponents yeah. off, he showed up late on purpose. Show late, yeah, exactly. Disrespecting he them. He was a bit of a heel, man. Yeah, like uh, Ali. Muhammad Ali was doing the same. But um, the, the another example is uh, actually the uh, founder of Kyokushin Kai Karate, uh, Masoyama. Yeah. Uh, the movie Fighter in the Wind is a great way of showing the reality of being a martial artist. I haven't artist. seen that one. I'll put that you on. You never saw this, Fighter man. in the Wind. Ramsey, you're going to have to see this one. I'm going to have to watch, look this one up. Fighter in the Wind. Okay. Fighter in the Wind is one of on the list. most wonderful martial arts movie I saw. The fight scenes are amazing, like literally amazing. Uh, and uh, it shows kind of like, you know, the, self niche, the selfishness of the martial artist. Hmm. Where, you know, you have you train in the mountain. Um, you have to reject everything else. And again, I talk about that before, like why did I, st why I'm not fighting anymore? It's because to be a martial artist, to be strong, to be the best, you have to be selfish. Yeah. Your life, let's say like this table is my life. Muay Thai, martial arts and everything is around, like Ramsey is where I'm at, where you are. That's how, this is all the other things around my life. When you're a fighter, this is fighting, that's your career. Your life is just but a mere satellite around, that's just like gravitate around fighting. Mm. So you want to go out? Ah, you can't, you have to train. You want to eat some nice food? Ah, you're cutting weight, not for you. Yeah. You want to go to a three weeks holiday in Tanzania? You have a fight, you're gonna stay here and you're gonna train. So everything you do and you will do in your career is gonna be centered about you and yourself. Someone dies in your family, if you're like having a fight, believe me, you're gonna have to go to that fight because your schedule up. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's so you get it's injured, hard. You got a broken hand. Yeah. Tough luck. T tough luck. Like, Suck it up. Buttercup. Exactly. Better uh, better be ready to teach classes. So it's um, living as a fighter is living in a selfish way. You have to be selfish. Unfortunately, yeah. 
you cannot be looking at everyone and everything when you're a fighter. That's why you cannot... When, when you say selfish, I think it's a, it's a different thing than most people <coughs> think of. They hear selfish, they think of a greedy guy just taking no. everything. But, but it's... It's more like, when I say selfish, it's like you're going to have to... It's not really about yourself anymore. It's about like the goals you have. You're going to have to put everything you have, and again, yourself included, to the task. That's why I say like your life is part of the satellite. This is the greater goal. This is your vision. This is your reality. That's why you're gonna have to put everything in. It's not even selfish. It's like you're gonna have to be selfish and selfless in the same time. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's tough. It's very tough, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's not made for everyone, myself included. Like and again, like living this kind of lifestyle is, is not where I believe happiness is at the end of the day. It was fun, and I want to go back into fighting one day. But once I achieve my goals. Once I have a, my uh, situation. It's a different kind of lifestyle, man. It's like totally different. Totally different. Between the year 2009 and 2011, which I honestly don't remember much about because I literally had the memories punched out of my head <laughs> in my last fight, man. But I was fighting a lot. Like I was, It was like a real-life version of Street Fighter Two, flying around to these different countries in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia and China and all over, fighting different martial artists, representing different styles mm -hmm. and different combat sports. And it was really exciting. But at the same time, it was, uh, it's a really taxing it's lifestyle. It's draining, and if you have a wife? Yeah. If you have a wife, if you have kids, good luck. My, my wife, I mean, I was basically putting her through hell. That, that's basically. what I mean. She was worried, sick yeah. about me. I'd come home with black eyes with my mm. face messed up, and she would be like, why are you doing yeah. this? And I'd be like... You do this when I you have a dream. really have a good reason for it other than, mm. you know, the paycheck, but... So you see, that's not a good yeah. reason. You're a fighter when you have a dream when your dream is what fills you when the the hope of being the best and you, you really have that dream you want to be the best you want to be on the top of the mountain that's what yeah. like that's where you should be embrace a career as a fighter if you do it for money you choose the wrong job you choose the wrong job do anything yeah. else but fighting after Unfortunately, i learned that the hard way man once on, between the moment people are gonna screw over, screw you over with money Yes. You're going to get injured and you're going to have to pay for your own expense, flight ticket. You're going to have to spend that time, you know, uh, uh, training. So you're not making much money outside because you're training two times per day. The food, the, it's a lot of expensive. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you train like that or you prepare like that for what? Two months, two months per fight, let's say. It's two months of your life to gain what at the end of the day? 2,000 mm. US, 3,000 US? Yeah. I mean, even if it's a big payday fight, I mean, it's even if still, it's still, uh, at, as no, uh, look, the risk to reward ratio is yeah, tremendous. Yeah, unless you're really making like 4k a year, uh, 40k a year out of fighting, I would not consider that. Like you know, uh, yeah, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Yeah, man, and and something something I don't think is talked about enough is how many people will try to exploit and take advantage of fighters. They are. So an incredible lot of middlemen who want to insert themselves and will try to insert themselves and ultimately will insert themselves yeah. between you, your paycheck, your health, and your safety. Yeah. And they will, I mean, they're charismatic sociopaths. I've met more than one of them. And they're very good at what they do. Yeah. And fighters don't get enough fair warning about this, to yeah. be honest. My, that's a good thing that I always respected with my father. Is like my father was my big, big, making people fight. He never took a cent out of them, never. Yeah. always doing like my father was very selfless like he invested all his life into the life of other basically and um that's something i really, really respected is like he never made muay thai to make money he never taught martial arts to make money our membership in france was 100 euro per year yeah. will you go to thailand oh, nice. and like wow. yeah it's you don't make we didn't make money out of that never so that's like barely keep the lights on money it's keeping the lights on and uh paying the bills of the gym and uh, and paying for the expense when uh, we take all the kids to travel to thailand cuba uh, the united states turkey and all over the world for months so that's something i really respected because i can see that normally this is a business mm. like you're you're Basically, you get kind of pimped by uh, your team. You make the money. They take mo they take a cut out of it, and that's like that for yeah. everything. The thing is, like, yeah, there is some people that are really not honest with that. They will tell you, "Oh, you're gonna get paid 10k when actually it was 40." Yeah. And this happens a lot. I have a lot of crazy story about that too, unfortunately. Or promoter not paying, 
you yes. fight and you don't get paid. The promoter take the money and disappear into thin hair. Yep. So Rebel yeah. FC, I'm looking at you, man. You still uh, owe me 4,000 RMB. That's not even that much money. It's not even that much money. Yeah, it's it's about the it's about the message behind, and I really believe that this happened a lot. But well, it happened a lot in in normal life too uh, when you work for people in China. You yeah, see fit, I see you. But yeah, it's 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 a problem, and there really isn't enough awareness about this. I, <coughs> I just really want to bring up that point because there are so many so many young guys who watch my channel, and they're like, I want to be a fighter, uh, I want to yeah. go pro, and. You know, that, that's great, and, and I hope it works out for you. But at the same time, I really want you to be aware of not just the risks of fighting, but, you know, the, the evil people out there who want to exploit you. Like yeah. when you said pimp, that, that's the it's, right word it's, for these it's guys. It's literally getting pimped. Like there is they no other word. They will treat you like a prostitute. They'll yeah. treat you like a piece of meat. Yeah. They will pimp you out. And the day you're not useful anymore, there is always the next guy. Yeah. Again, like the, the best advice I can give as someone who grew up like that and saw like thousands and thousands of fighters coming going get some people on a nice team that you can trust people that you you start with and that's been there since with you since day one that's some people that you know want your good and not something that's interested for who you are like a lot of people like when you start to get succeeded a lot of people are going to get toward you oh the crowd are going to come people are going to be like oh you're the best and they're going to try to take some of that mojo that you have but once it's gone those people are going to go Try to really find some people that are interested in you, want you to succeed, yeah. and that do that in a kind of, yeah, selfless way. Yeah, man, it's a, oh. it's, it's a fairly common practice for coaches or cornermen to take a certain percentage of the fighter's purse, but I've, I yeah. have never been able to bring myself to do that because... Because um, you've been I, through it. Because, <laughs> yes, I, I paid the literal blood, sweat, and tears yeah. during those the hardest paychecks I got in my life and, and I know what that money means to a fighter like I know what that means I, I had one one fighter I, I coached he um, had this awesome kickboxing match knocked the dude through the ropes it was amazing but then afterwards he he gives me some of his paycheck I'm like dude you keep this like you earned this I, I was I, I just came along for the ride man he's like no no I insist and in like three times we went through this and he finally insisted I take like a small percentage of it and at the same time I was like I I would never ask a fighter to give me a, a percentage of their paycheck it just like I, I physically can't do it it just makes me ill just understanding where that money came from no, I think um, I think if the the relationship in the beginning is business this I could understand but then yeah. like things are written black and white since yeah. day one like I'm not judging people who like I did that before like money. you know when I had some people coming in China like Rafael for example he was a, a multiple time world champion he grew up with my family uh, doing martial arts uh, Muay Thai and uh, when he came here when he was fighting I was making his preparation I was taking that my, my time like you know to hold pass yeah. do that so of course but he knew I was gonna take a small percent of that uh, of that uh, shake and yeah. straight away I was showing there's, him there's look that agreement before that's that. how you get paid that's without anything I just take that cut all the rest is yours but there is this agreement when people do it where they don't actually tell you how much it's been made and they are being yeah. sneaky about it that's where there exactly. is a problem and mm. most of the time it's like that they will show you something and at the back there is like two times more that was uh, lying, uh, lying sometimes back. even more man. same time even more unfortunately there's a man, certain evil slime ball middleman who used to yeah. used to uh, promote fighters here in, in China and he yeah. would take not just 10% he would take the lion's share yeah. and he would take like 90% of the paychecks and I remember once uh, the fighters confronted him about it he was like it's just business guys and they were like not anymore bye and he was yeah. like oh get back here you'll You'll fail without me. Yeah, uh, I know this. I know. I'm pretty sure I know the who we're talking about. Yeah. But like, yeah, there is a uh, not owns, but there is a lot of people like that. Unfortunately, a lot, a lot, a lot. It's not uh, isolated incidents. Yeah. So, rule number one of all fighting: protect yourself at all times, not just inside the ring but and outside. outside too. <laughs> outside too, and we're not just talking about street fights yeah. here, man. Protect yourself from people generally speaking that's why having a, a team of that's why you know for me the community is the most important aspect when you yeah. have a gym for me community it's not like just people that come and take I take their money and uh, I train them no it's more than that it's like yeah. you create bond with people you it's like a family at the end of the day right. it's like and not just 
bullshit family oh we're a family but as soon as something bad happened like oh i'm left and i'm right now it's something or you go through life with people by your side even if it's good when it's bad and i have some people that i really respect for that like for example uh, uh, salo and some other uh, guys here that no matter what happened good bad they're here and they have a word like you know when they give you their word when they're there is meaning behind and uh, not many men can have so don't have this ones, uh, yeah. it's one of the good guys so yeah having a community that you that can back you up and that you can uh, trust is trust one of the most life, important assets I should point that out trust with your life yeah, like yeah trust literally. with your life literally literally trust with your life like I, re I remember for example when I just came in Shanghai uh, I was at uh, Dragon Warrior and there is this guy Alex um, that when I just came, I was out of shape. Uh, I was, uh, I didn't train or anything for months because of work. And um, I told that guy, look, I can fight at 70 kilograms, 72 kilograms I can fight. I just need four or five months to get really back into shape because I didn't train or anything for months. And uh, the guy like, uh, let me spar with this fighter. And well, even if I was out of shape, I'm still a good striker. So the guy was like, oh, uh, that's amazing. Uh, we're going to make you fight. I'm like, yeah, sure. In four months, 72 kilograms, anyone. A week later, he come to me and be like, oh, you have a fight uh, in uh, three weeks, 80 kilograms. Oh, we lo win, lose, no problem. Hmm. You get paid that, win, lose, no problem. I'm like, what? I'm like, losing is a problem. Let's, losing is a problem. make no mistake about so, that. Like, what? I'm like, no, I told you, like, I will not fight before four months because I'm out of shape. He's like, oh, but, and again, no, lose, no problem. You stick. I'm like, no, but you don't understand. I don't, we don't talk about a match. We talk about a fight at 80 kilograms, so much heavier than what I was uh, in my weight cat. Who am I going to fight? Well, how are you going to bring someone that's cutting weight? That if, if I get a uh, high kicked in the neck, I fall and... Uh, yeah, that's a I end up in a coma. This guy doesn't care about you, he cares exactly. about the paycheck. And we lose no problem. What this means, like, yeah, you take your cut and then you don't care. It's like, yeah, there is people like that. You win or you lose, I get paid. Yeah, you happens. win, you lose, I get paid. So that's the, that's the thing. You have to be very, very careful because, again, fighting is not a joke. You don't play boxing. You don't play uh, martial arts. You don't play MMA. You can play football. There is a lot of things you can play. Martial arts you don't play with because the consequences behind are extremely serious. You can die. As simple as that, you can die. It happened before. True, True the unfortunate and sobering or be reality. Crippled. Yeah. Like uh, Michael Bisping lost an eye. Like There is so many people that got crippled by martial arts. Again, if you want to be a fighter, follow a dream. Follow something that you know you have deep within your heart and you want to become like you know the best because that's how you feel. That's, you feel this is your way. But if it's just like you don't know, get a few fights just for fun. But investing your life, your time, and your future into fighting is not for everyone. So many champions of the golden era are not so miserable because people that they trusted they shouldn't have or didn't manage enough or just got exploited. So be very careful about that fighting. I fought for fun because I like to fight, but making a career out of it, it's, it's a big decision. You have to make sure like, you, know, you have everything uh, solid up for you. You cannot just walk blindly into, into that kind of decision. And even coaching, <coughs> like, man, coaching martial arts. I had a discussion with Salo about this, speaking of Salo, a really cool guy, uh, jiu-jitsu instructor here in, in Shanghai. Like, it's, it's not something you do for the money. No. Like, it's, it's not. I mean, there, there are people, <laughs> there are some people, like uh, <coughs> Tom DeBlas, he's a jiu-jitsu coach in, in the U.S., pretty strong following on social <coughs> media, great guy. And he's got some great tips about how to make money if you are a martial arts instructor, and that, that's great. And, and you should try to do that. You sh obviously should try to have a profitable business. But there are much, much more profitable businesses out there. I mean, if you're getting into martial arts, it's got to be something you love. Yep. Because otherwise... You have to be out of patience. I totally agree. I agree. You can you can do make some money when you have PT and like a crowd of people. Like uh, I know people that make a lot of money like that. Like you know, uh, myself right now, I'm I'm not making like a tons of money, but I'm getting back to it step by step by having PT, having people that are coming more and more because they like uh, the the vibe we have at the gym. Yeah. But um, yes, it, it's not something you do because you follow money. You do do some banking, do some other things. But yeah. 
um, you do it out of passion. And for me, I love what I do. Like it's, I don't feel it as, I don't feel it's work. I've been working before. I know what is working. It's not working. It's having fun. It's sharing. It's, and you still get money out of it. But yeah, I, it's I good to have a salary. So. If um, if mm. the money you made as a martial arts instructor was based on how good you actually are at martial arts and teaching martial arts versus how good you are at business acumen, how different would the world be? <laughs> Probably not very different as a whole, but yeah. the martial arts community probably very vastly different. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think to make some money as a martial, as a coach, you still have to get like you know, well, be good at what you do. Even though like you can be a scam artist and like teach some bushido, like we can see it on YouTube, uh, a lot of people doing that. Master Wong. <laughs> <laughs> so for the, <coughs> for the street, you can be just like a total bushido, but. You, Bullshido master, but of Dux, um, all these guys like the uh, Dillman, George yeah. Dillman, this guy made millions out of uh, yeah, man. George, Dillman, that's, George Dillman is such a weird story because, yeah. like, back in the day, like, he was, he was a legitimate karate guy putting on legitimate karate tournaments, and then slowly he turns into this no touch, that's what I mean, knockout weirdo, and and he made more happened? money, and he made more money, yes. but it's just because I think that to have make money like that, you st so you still need to be good, but it's more about social interaction. When you're a coach, you have a lot of social interaction. People are going to talk to you about their problem, their life. They're going to expect you to listen, uh, give them uh, counseling stuff that. You have to do when you're a coach, like, you know, it's, it's not only teaching martial arts. Of course, it's important, but there is all this social interaction that you have with people that are going to make them want to actually invest some of their time and money in you. Yeah. And that's, that's totally true. But, yeah, man. but uh, this apply more when you start to go into people's head. Uh, if you, if otherwise, it's just because uh, you're a good coach, you have a good way of explaining and people like, and you're a likable person. It's, it's fascinating what, what can sometimes bring people to your gym or keep them there. Like uh, a few years ago, there were a lot of women coming into this gym, and like more than I'd seen at other gyms. And I, I asked some of them, like, well, why did you choose this gym over the other gyms? And they said, we like the changing rooms. There's, there's shampoo and soap in there, and it's, it's clean. It like, smells good. <laughs> so the, the coaches, eh. <clears throat> the, the facilities, eh. The changing rooms. That was the, that was the deal. That Deep was the break, deal. Uh, break, uh, man. That was... That was a seal deal. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, sometimes it's small things that are making people take their decision. But the community, I, I really believe what keep a gym alive is the, is the community. Yes. If you have a strong community, it stay together. You could train like, you know, under a bridge. If the community is strong, people are going to follow you under that bridge. True, man. True. I, I've been teaching under a bridge, literally, like uh, really? uh, during COVID. I was oh, literally yeah, yeah. teaching under a bridge. And I had like, yeah, 20 people coming. Yeah. I was teaching outdoor, I was like in the calisthenics park, I was going teaching there. And it was fun. The community was there, it was together. You know, the, the facility and stuff, it, it's great, of course, to have nice, nice facility and hot water. And, but you don't need any of that at the end of the day if the yeah. community is strong. It's true, man. Um, shout out to my friend Jordan <laughs> Gussie. He's a, he's a martial arts uh, concrete breaking champion. And he trains in his backyard. And, and uh, we've had some conversations mm. about how some, some other folks, they look at his YouTube channel and they're like, oh, you're training in your backyard, you're not legit. Yeah, so what? He's like, so what? Oyama was you training in the mountains. You can, the Kyokushin guy, guy were training in the mountains with like, you know, uh, yeah. in the mountains. In the mountains. It's like, there's no G, no electricity, nothing, mountains. It's, it, at the end of the day, like, people, they can train in their garage and become world champion. As long as you have like people with you and like, you know, and you're, it doesn't matter if you're like, you know, you are the, the best institute in the world. Of course, it's going to play later, but you can start with a very humble place. The, uh, this is basically the plot of Rocky IV, you know, <laughs> where Dolph Lundgren's character yeah. is training in the yeah. best facility <clears throat> in the world and Rocky's Taking out there in the snow, pushing logs yeah. overhead and stuff. But in, at the end of the day, like... This can still give you like good reasons. I, I like to take the example in uh, some place in Thailand, in Isan. They have nothing. They have nothing. Mm. They're trained on the, on the on dirt and uh, they have one bag uh, or they have like tire truck and that's it. Yeah. Or you go in Africa where like, you know, uh, 
same they have nothing and they still like you know produce some fighter they produce some uh, nice guys yeah. uh, you go to uh, you go to Cuba where like same they don't have much and they have yes. amazing boxers it doesn't and always seen, have to do with the, the facility. wrestling room that the, <coughs> the uh, Olympic wrestlers in Cuba use and it's a uh, it's a pretty old rundown yeah. scratched up mat and you know a couple of barbells off on the side and that's about it my father went to Cuba, I think, uh, 26 years ago uh, with uh, boxers. So you can imagine 26 years back in Cuba, there was not many, uh, much thing. So they had boxers. Yeah. It's not always about, like, you know, the facility, even though it's a plus. It's about the people that are there, who you train with, how you train. Like, that's what's important in the end. True, man. Who you surround yourself with makes always. a big difference. That's kind of a central message of this uh, podcast, isn't it? Yeah. This in, in martial arts and in life, like you know, you are who you hang out with. That's why it's it's important to you know, it's important. My father was told me to not be friend with everyone. It's mm. like I mean, to the monde, I'm person. It's man being friend with everyone be, is being friend with no one. Et yeah. plaire à tout le monde, c'est plaire à n'importe qui. So it's it's important to surround yourself with some people and not surround yourself with some other, because again, not everyone wants you. Uh, want you to succeed not everyone uh, is a good part of a community so it's yeah. it's important to surround yourself with good people and uh, yeah. and it's important to make that distinction like you know be nice to people be friendly <coughs> to always. people but you always. don't have to invite everybody into your inner circle as yes you will. exactly I think it's it's very important too uh, and I read this this um, study on human psychology a long time ago it basically <coughs> said in our lifetime, we basically have room and time in our social circle for basically 12 people. And we look at our social media accounts and like, I've got 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. i got a million followers. I wish. I wish I had. Platform. So it gives us the illusion we have tons of friends and yeah. eyeballs on us. And we've, we've got eyes on us, but that's a very different thing. I mean, think about the... The people who are closest to you, the people you spend the most time with, the people you have the most influence over, the people who have the most influence over you, it's probably not more than a dozen people. Yeah. And so you've got to be very careful about essentially who you consider your family mm. in your life. I agree. And there is a lot of wolves in sheep's clothes. So, yeah, yeah gotta be careful. But well, usually time tell. Indeed. Well, Juwadam, I'm glad you are part of the community here in Shanghai, man. Thanks, Ramsey. Equally. <laughs> so, let's make some technique, some technique videos, man. I am Perfect. dying to, to see a breakdown of the ghost kick, man. This is sure. Let's this do is this. a technique you always get me with every time you spar. <laughs> I, I want to see how it's done, man. You're going to see it's quite easy. I'm pretty sure with your flexibility, you're going to nail it uh, quite fast. Outstanding. Let's get out there and train. Perfect. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching, everyone.